Well, Right Angle is a show about current events, and I hate to kind of come to the show with old news. But as it turns out, uh, just a few days ago, the Wright Flyer flew again. Uh, it has made its seventh flight, ladies and gentlemen. It flew four times on December 17th, 1903. Uh, and then I've just got the numbers written down here. 23,957 days after that, it made its uh, fifth flight when it landed on the moon on July 20th in 1969. 10,693 days after that, the Wright Flyer made its sixth flight when it went into orbit with John Glenn on STS-95 on Discovery. And then 8,208 days after that, it made its seventh flight, which was April 19th, 2021, and the Wright Flyer not only made its four flights in uh, Kitty Hawk and was then destroyed, but pieces of it have been to the moon, have been in Earth orbit, and now they have flown on Mars on board the Ingenuity helicopter a mere 42,858 days after its first flight. That's 117 years, four months, and two days later. The Ingenuity helicopter on Mars carries a small piece of fabric from the Wright Flyer, and it had just yesterday, as we record this, completed the first powered flight on another planet, which is really quite a remarkable achievement. But that's not what I want to talk about today. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Whittle with Steve Green and Scott Ott. And uh, I actually want to talk about something a little different. So um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you a montage, a very quick collection of, of clips of some remarkable footage uh, taken as the opportunity I'm sorry, as the uh, Ingenuity helicopter actually achieved its first flight. And we're going to zoom in on the amazing footage that I want all of you to take a quick look at. All actuators appear healthy. Ingenuity's reporting, having performed spin-up, takeoff, climb, hover, descent, landing, touchdown, and spin-down. Altimeter data confirms that Ingenuity has performed its first flight, first flight of a powered aircraft on another planet. Now, for those of you that think that the uh, director of the Ingenuity program, a young woman named Mimi Ong, is related to Nancy Pelosi, though she's simply tearing up her contingency speech for what she was going to say if the helicopter did not get off the ground or if it had crashed or whatever the case may be. Her tearing up that piece of paper was basically an admission that what she'd spent her last 10, 15 years working on pretty much every day of her life had just been achieved. She is the program manager for the Ingenuity helicopter that has flown on another planet in air that is 1% as thick as the Earth. It's essentially a vacuum, but she got a helicopter to fly there anyway. Uh, Steve, I don't want to commit this from, from the angle of what an incredible technological achievement it is, because that's, I think, self-evident. What I want to do is I would like to talk a little bit about, about the expression on, on Mimi Ong's face and what it is like. I guess what I'm trying to say is this. No one watching this is ever going to be as happy as Mimi Ong was yesterday, because I don't think anyone has ever put so much of their lives, well, with a few exceptions, Neil Armstrong and others uh, among them, but for people who, who kind of go through life on, on, on cruise control, there is a fundamental level of happiness that comes from, from working incredibly hard over a long period of time and then succeeding. It is what humanity is all about. It is a, it is a, a gratification and a joy and a, and a, and a sigh of relief that is unparalleled by any other human activity. What's it like to do something hard and succeed? And why is it that more people should be trying that? Do you think, Steve? 
Well, number one, it's the greatest thing in the world, I would imagine. I've never done anything quite so cool as to fly a helicopter on an alien world. Um, I, I want to read something to you, and this is this was the first thing I thought of when I saw that clip of her tearing up her letter. I'm just going to read this to you. It said, Our landings in the Cherbourg Harve area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold, and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack mm -hmm. at this time and place was based on the best information available. The troops, the air, and the Navy did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. That's the uh, brief address that General Eisenhower wrote in case the D-Day landings had failed. Eisenhower didn't save that note that he'd written. It's, it's handwritten. You can find it online. Uh, an aide of his found it and preserved it for the historical records. Uh, and that's the thing you have to prepare for. You can't achieve something great without that risk of failure and to be prepared for it. Because if you aren't prepared for it, you're probably going to be overconfident and not achieve the great thing that you're trying to do. Um, I'm not sure how flying a helicopter on Mars, which blows my mind, it's amazing, uh, compares to the D-Day landings on a historical scale. Um, they might just be equivalent. Um, one saved the world. I think the other shows that we're going to gain the ability to change another world. And that's all thanks to this young... Oh, I keep wanting to call her a young woman, Bill. She's, She's 52. 53. 53. She I'm going to be 52 young. next week. She looks half my age. In addition to effusing over her accomplishment, I want to know what her skincare regime is. <laughs> uh, Scott, the, um, the, the achievement is, is one thing, but, but I, I really do want to concentrate on the emotional aspect of it. Um, there is... There, there, there is a, a tendency for things to get easier and easier and easier these days, and 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 for the attention spans to get shorter and everything else. The the thing that was so uh, enjoyable for me to watch was was the amount of of effort that went into it, and then the reward. And of course, all the telemetry comes back slowly. She didn't just go, "Hey, we did it." It's like, "Oh my God, this is still alive. It's still, yay, we there." But but could you talk a little bit about this idea of you get out of life what you put into it that 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 it, on some level the amount of, of joy and and satisfaction you get is almost like a a, repl a a repayment of an account that you have to pay into in the first place for a long long time I mean for she's a long, been running long time. this she's been running this project for years. Um, and all of it aimed at this first moment, uh, and this this could have been the end of it right here. If this if this copter had failed to get up into the air, or it just crashed, or whatever, and they wouldn't have been able to follow up and do any of the other missions that they have planned for it, and that would be the end of you know I don't know how long the official project was, but you know if it was seven years, the seven years of nothing but trying to focus on that singular task, and it could have failed at that moment, and all of that effort. Uh, to me, would have looked like a waste. I don't think it would have looked like a waste to her because there is something about spending yourself for a purpose and spending every last nickel of yourself on that purpose and putting it all out there and willing to accept the verdict of physics, of God, of the population, of whoever it is that you're trying to, uh, to appease in this situation, um, to be able to utterly devote yourself to a cause and then see it come to fruition um, is the greatest experience that a human can aspire to. And I would say the second greatest experience is to be able to completely devote yourself to a cause and ultimately fail at it. Because that teaches a lesson that's even more valuable, in essence, than the success. And if you look at the history of successful people, and I'm sure this woman's history would be the same, you will find a, 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 a field of wreckage of <laughs> leading up to the ultimate triumph. You know, it was the, the Wright brothers' first attempt to get into the air wasn't uh, at Kitty Hawk on that day. <laughs> um, and I just finished uh, last year, I think, um, reading the Wright brothers' uh, biography by an author who I've now read like five books from and I can't recall his name. But anyway, it was a great uh, biography of the Wright brothers. And what fascinated me about it was how much they did 
afterward, after that first flight. Like we, we think that was like the pinnacle of their lives, but their lives were amazing after the fact. And, in, and, and this leader of this uh, ingenuity mission, when she did give her speech, the one that she didn't have to tear up, one of the things she noted was that the Wright brothers took a moment to celebrate and we should, and they did. But she said, then they got back to work and they got that thing and in the air again, it. and then they got it in the air again, because this becomes something that drives you. And I had a note to myself here that one of the fascinating things to me is, as amazing as it is that they were able to, you know, fly some 10 feet in the air from the Martian surface and safely land again, I think it's almost as amazing that they know that it happened. I think that it's amazing that we uh, that we have any kind of telemetry, let alone pictures and video of this event that actually showed that it happened on such a distant world. And that back to work mentality uh, is something that I, I hope each of us gleans from this experience and then applies in some way to our daily lives. If you're watching this, don't just go, wow, isn't that cool that somebody can do that? Because it doesn't take an engineering degree. It doesn't take aeronautical experience or physical knowledge or anything like that. It takes a sense of devotion to a purpose to which you're willing to expend yourself entirely. And you, my friend, and I both have that ability. I had a cognitive dissonance experience when I first started uh, writing Eject, Eject, Eject 10 years ago now or more. I was reading a, a flying magazine consistently, and, and one of my favorite uh, uh, columnists was a guy named Rod Machado. And I was reading his column as I did every single month, and, and, I'm, and I'm looking at it, and, and Rod Machado says, uh, commentator Bill Whittle says that we don't call uh, trash cans or air conditioners she, but we do with airplanes. And I thought to myself, oh, there's some, some of the guy named Bill Whittle out there writing about, about these kind of – and I realized, oh, oh that's me. But the point of all this is this, the personalization of a machine comes from the human emotion that goes into it. We are rooting for the rover, but the rover's not alive and neither is ingenuity. Ingenuity is a box of silicon and tin and some carbon fiber, but it is alive to the degree that the people that built it are on board it. It's alive to the degree that it carries all of their efforts, it carries all of their aspirations, and it carries all of their sense of history. Uh, by including a piece of cloth on from the right flyer on that uh, Ingenuity helicopter, which Scott pointed out to me in our pre-stage uh, backstage show, the team of of young scientists who are who have made this most recent uh, amazing piece of technological breakthrough are also connecting themselves to the technological breakthroughs and the hard work of the past. The right flyer has been to the moon. The right flyer has been in Earth orbit. The right flyer has landed on Mars. And while there's not an awful lot of right flyer to begin with, because it was destroyed in a storm right after the fourth flight, I can assure you that the right flyer will go to Mars again. The right flyer will eventually go to the stars. The right flyer is going to go everywhere. Because more than anybody, the Wright brothers personified this idea of perseverance and ingenuity. You can't just be smart. You got to be smart over time. And that's what it takes. And my only concern here is simply this. Uh, a few days before uh, Perseverance uh, got to Mars, the, the Chinese had put their first uh, probe in orbit around Mars. That's quite an achievement, orbiting another planet. Uh, Americans did this first time, first time it was ever done was in uh, 1971 with Mariner 9. So there where we were in 1971, and now we're lowering things on sky cranes and rovers and helicopters coming off of it and all the rest of it. And that's great. And all of the, and all of the people in that room look like they were 11 years old. And that's great too. What concerns me is this. Our technological pyramid is getting more and more and more narrow. We, when China graduates more engineers than we graduate students in a year, and when American educational system continues to fall, I don't even think we're in the top 30 anymore of science and math, then you are coasting on momentum. That is not the recipe for the future. The recipe for the future is to broaden that base so you have large number of American students excelling in engineering and math. And the thing that concerns me is, I don't know if anybody's gonna be telling her story or even telling the story of how engineering works. 
Back in the space age, the Apollo era, everything was space. Space toys, space this, space that, the astronauts were heroes, all of this. It would be great if somebody could find a way to use entertainment to dramatize what this woman and her team have achieved in a human sense and use that to create an entire new generation of engineers because Scott got it exactly right. He got it 100% right. That Perseverance lander could have crashed into Mars. It could have exploded on launch. It could have done all of those things. Maybe the helicopter just wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have mattered. What mattered is the effort. These people have added another step, another step, and another step built on the steps before. And Isaac Newton, who basically made the whole trip possible, said that if I see so far, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm. Uh, Mimi Young and her team have have put another giant pair of shoulders out there for other people to stand on and look a little further. And I hope they get the credit that they deserve. And I hope they get the impact that they deserve and not just have this. be That was kind of a cool day. For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Whittle. And parenthetically, I might add, it was kind of a cool day. 